this moment where I, uh, we have many members who have participated on the survey. So we will be going through the survey report uh, where we have asked the members to give suggestions on the topics where they like to attend. So we have those suggestions and we also took suggestions for uh, how you guys like to in the meeting like face to face online system. so i can i can see as for the survey report it's 50 50. right so most of them like to have online at the same other half like to have uh, online section or face to face so we'll be continuing this session uh hopefully in coming months we'll be starting face to face section uh, in vibrant actually we plan to start the section this month but again, we thought to hold the process for a few more months uh, to see the restriction, how it goes off. So mostly from next month or in another month, we will be starting our face-to-face -face section and we will be having our live streaming as well. So I would like to encourage our members to come forward to uh, for the face-to-face -face section so we, we can have our interactions and we can discuss on more topics. And most of the members, majority of the members suggested for one hour section. So we go to the same one hour, one and a half hour section, uh, depend upon the topic which we choose. And we have many topics in our mind, current coming sessions. So once it's finalized, uh, we will be posting it down LinkedIn and we'll shoot them to you guys as well. So without delaying, I'd like to welcome John Evick. Uh, to deliver the section. Janik, so the stage is yours. Thank you, Deepu. So one of the beauty of having uh, this networking in uh, IIRSM, and we had this group chat, was that uh, when someone needs to support, uh, one could freely chat in and request for help. And uh, I volunteered to deliver this topic, as I saw in the uh, Previous months, there was an uh, inquiry about uh, some of our practitioners doing uh, who is required to do a FEMEA for our process. And I reached out and uh, we did the FEMEA and uh, it was a very nice process. And uh, yes, good evening, everybody. My name is John Evick Valdez. I'm working in Hazima Barrett General Hospital as the head of risk and patient safety. And I'm going to share with you today, uh, tonight, uh, about failure mode and effects analysis. So uh, before I begin, let me just start with my administration, administration that I have not, uh, I, I do not have anything to disclose that it comes uh, in conflict of the interests of IIRSM as well as uh, with HMC. And at the end of this presentation, uh, it is our hope that you understand what FEMEA is if you're not yet aware of that as a risk management tool and how and when do we use FEMEA and what are the steps? If we're going to use FEMEA, how should we go about it and demonstrate the prioritization process of failure modes? Right. So the word itself, failure mode and effects analysis, you see the word there, failure mode, I have uh, highlighted in green. It's telling about specific ways in which failures may occur. And then when these failures occur, it creates an impact to the organization whether you're doing a scaffolding, whether you're doing a lifting, whether you are in the food industry, you're doing your heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, or probably uh, you are doing your uh, whatever process uh, in the manufacturing, each of those have a process that uh, you need to follow. And we're not just simply talking about um, processes, we're talking about systems, we're talking about design, we're talking about procedures, and this is the time probably that I invite you to revisit your SOPs or the standard operating procedures. If each or, or if one or two or three of these uh, steps in your procedure for scaffolding fail, or when you're doing your lifting or when you're doing your excavation, so what could be the impact? And when we talk about impact, it's not, not only uh, referred to safety, and sometimes it impacts operations. Sometimes also it impacts uh, business, business continuity. So this is what we're going to talk about today. So how do we, how do we make sure that we identify, had a broad and comprehensive understanding of the failure mode 
and how does it impact when this failure mode occur? We don't want this failure to occur. We wanted a smooth uh, uh, time to do whatever we need to do. But in order for us to do that, we need to be proactive. That's what a risk management is for. Rather than we learn from incidents, well, that's not, there's nothing wrong about that. But it saves time, it saves resources when we act before an incident occurs. We cannot pre uh, predict and prevent everything. Uh, the, the summation is that we do everything we can to make sure that these failure modes are identified, they are assessed, and they are acted upon. So, what is FEMIA? That's a brief history. So, FEMIA has been used as a risk identification and reduction tool for how many decades now? Uh, the approach was actually developed uh, by the United States military in the late 1940s. And for almost uh, 70 to 80 years, they have a small relative evolutionary enhancements. So you see it over time in 1960s, NASA have used it, as well as the auto industry. And AIG, the Automotive uh, Action Group, have also taken uh, had, uh, taken steps to make sure that this is improved. So in 2019, substantial changes were actually introduced and harmonized the differences in conduct, uh, conducting the FMEAs. So uh, the FMEA is widely known as fim, uh, failure mode effects analysis, uh, was developed a technique to reduce sources of variation by the United States military, uh, because there are a lot of variation. They have different ways of doing things. Uh, also in uh, ammunitions, and they found out that it is a very effective tool. So once that they have uh, 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 published their article that uh, they have used a technique called uh, FMEA, NASA adopted it, and it's a part of the methodology as a crucial planning uh, technique that uh, they have used, and they proved to be also uh, vital to the success of Apollo and subsequent uh, uh, NASA missions. So FEMIA are widely used by the civil aviation of, uh, industry, and it was actually in 1970s where in Ford Motor Company led, led the way as an internal response to safety and public relations issues uh, with, uh, if you remember, Ford Pinto in the mid-1970s. So other automotive manufacturers in the U.S. Uh, in Europe, uh, also follow uh, for sleep. Now, AIG was formed in 1982 to get a fierce uh, U.S. Uh, auto industry competition uh, to collaborate and agree with standardize of use of uh, quality improvement tools and practices such as uh, FMEA and statistical process tools. So, it uh, took time from 1941 to right now where we are. I don't know if uh, you're aware of that of FMEA. Some industries do. And some industries are, uh, when we were asking what, if you're aware of FMEA, they hardly have heard it. So FMEA is a common process analysis tool. So when we talk about common process analysis tool, so I love to, I highlighted it in blue because uh, the process analysis tools, as actually when we uh, say talk about it, is an intersection between quality, uh, safety, and uh, risk. So it's not about uh, them or uh, so it's about actually working together to analyze risk. So examples of process analysis tools is flowchart. So we have a picture of what's a uh, sequential order of a procedure, uh, including materials or services, uh, right? And then uh, one of these is failure mode effects analysis, which we're going to uh, talk later on. Okay, okay, or the mistake proofing. It's a, it's a use of any automatic device or method that uh, you know makes it impossible for error to occur. Like for example, I'd like you to imagine your microwave. Your microwave, when you uh, when you press it on and you open it when it's running, what happens to the microwave? The microwave suddenly stops. So that makes sure that uh, the person who is exposed to that uh, microwave oven is uh, safe. So that's uh, what we call the uh, mistake proofing. And spaghetti diagram, so spaghetti diagram is uh, if the person went here, you, so you trace it and you put it in a paper and you see that uh, it creates a diagram. So it's a proactive analysis because uh, before 
the failure mode occur. When we talk about failure mode, what is it? What could go wrong? I'm referring to what could go wrong. So before anything that could go wrong occur, say you already have, uh, have identified it within the processes. So it's a uh, quantitative methodology. Some people don't like quantitative because it requires numbers and they don't like numbers, but I, I trust that you'll find it uh, easy. It's not much uh, complex uh, statistical uh, analysis. So it's a team-based activity to improve efficiencies. And there are uh, different kinds of FMEAs and they are categorized into subtypes based on the risk you're assessing. So you might have heard already of FFMEA or the functional failure mode and effects analysis. So FFMEA analyzes the risk that affect uh, the way a system functions. Um, the goal of FFMEA is they sometimes call it a system failure mode and effects analysis is to prevent these failures before they happen. So we have also the D code stands for the design. So the design, we're now, so I think you are now having an idea that we're, what we're doing is we're talking about the design. Uh, so that the FMEA assesses the risk of an asset into the design stage. So when you create this design, when you change the design, so does it create an impact? Does it create a failure mode? Does it create an issue? And right? so the purpose of which is to find and correct potential issues with an asset before it's deployed to increase its reliability, uh, reduce the amount of uh, maintenance required, uh, and extend the asset life cycle. We have also process or the PFMEA. So the process failure mode effect uh, and analysis seeks out you know, the possible failures within a process. So if this is process one, process two, process three, you look at the failures in each of these processes. The differences between uh, process, FMEA, and the rest of the FMEA is that it focuses on what could go wrong during the operation of the maintenance of a system. And uh, we have, uh, the last but not the least, the F, the failure mode, effects, and criticality analysis. So this word criticality in there, or they sometimes uh, make it a shortcut, criticality analysis. It analyzes both um, the failure mode and the level of risk associated with those failure modes. So either way, if you are um, measuring the functional, the design, the process, the system, or the criticality of uh, whatever you're doing, um, there is an FMEA that is to that. So when do we use FMEA? So FMEA is used to analyze failures of an existing, or when we call it a product, or procedure or protocol or a service. So when a product, uh, when a process or service is being designed or redesigned after a quality function deployment, or when you are evaluating a new process, so there's a new process, you created a new step in your SOP or products or services. So you, are, uh, you might want it to look at what are the failure modes and impacts. So before an existing process or product or service being applied in a new way. So before developing control um, plans for a new or modified process, okay, to evaluate high risk processes, like for example, when we talk about high risk processes, it could include uh, safety, it could include uh, business, or like for example, a very expensive um, uh, process or procedure we're talking and periodically throughout the life cycle of the process. So you wanted to uh, make sure that you have an, a regular review uh, of what are the processes in your um, work uh, or in your work area that you wanted to take a look if you could fail on that. So when analyzing failures, so we, look at the, uh, we look at whether there's a new product or there's a change of product, so on and so forth. All right. So, F FMEA is a tool that prompts team to review, evaluate, and record the following. So you have the steps. And I'd like you to uh, take note of these uh, keywords, a failure mode. So when I, I, mean, I think I mentioned that earlier. Failure mode is what could go wrong. So the mode, uh, what could uh, go wrong? And the cause. So why would the failure happen? So how does the uh, failure happen? So when we talk about failure, uh, we're talking about it could be an accident, it could be 
uh, an operation interruption or uh, something like that uh, will create uh, disruption in your uh, business. Uh, or it could be something that will stop the lifting at the, uh, that is going to supposed to be happening. It's a critical lifting, that's a tandem lifting, but you are going to stop that because of uh, a failure that is occurring on the things or probably on the in any step. And when these uh, failure occur, what could be the impact? So this is not that's very important that we understand the severity so that we could see the uh, action and the priority of uh, the priority of action that we need to do. So what are the basic steps uh, in conducting the FMEA? So in doing the FMEA, we need to identify the scope. So you need to uh, you need to select a process that you are uh, that you wanted to evaluate. If you are in the manufacturing process, you might want them to uh, review the packaging. If you are in the construction, you might want to review your excavation, the life critical activities like um, uh, transport of uh, steel fabrication, like ex uh, like confined spaces, or what we say critical lifting, as uh, scaffolding on heights. So you might want it to look at one process only, right? So if you're in healthcare, you might want it to look at medication administration, or if you are in uh, food industry, you might want it to look at uh, one process of uh, maintaining the food at a viable temperature or storage of food, or if you are in supply chain logistics, uh, the transport and shipment. So you choose one process or one activity in your workplace that you think that you wanted to review. And why do you want it to review? Probably there's a new product or there's a new step, or probably you wanted to uh, uh, check out that, okay, there's a change that we are uh, going to do, or before you, do, before you uh, implement that new change, or you simply wanted to review an existing uh, procedure or an existing policy or existing SOP or existing that, you know, you have been used to it and you wanted to take a look at uh, what are the failure modes. And you might be surprised, you might be surprised. In several FMEAs that we have done, um, some of the leadership members, executive team, the managers are astonished that, oh, we have we are wasting such man hours on this uh, on this process because it's giving us these failure modes. It's not working. So and this is giving us accidents. So you wanted we might wanted to uh, go back later on and have one example of, of uh, a procedure in your own workplace uh, to work on. And I'm oh, I'm in inviting you that you can um, have it share it with the group later on uh, what you're working at and we can help you out and then so evaluation of FMEA works best on processes that do not have many sub processes so uh, just one step a step if you're hoping to evaluate a large um, and complex process such as um, like for example for us in healthcare medication uh, management in the hospital so we divide it so you need to recruit a cross-functional team. So uh, we don't do risk assessments by ourselves. So the golden rule in risk management and you're doing the risk assessment is that you do it uh, with a cross-functional team or a multidisciplinary team. Your expertise might not be the expertise of others, but it is also known fact that their expertise is not your expertise. You need different eyes. So when we do a multidisciplinary risk assessment or FEMIA as well, we need the inputs of the quality manager or quality uh, engineer, the safety manager, the construction engineer, probably if you will, or probably uh, someone in the contractor or someone in the front line. Yeah, as long as you know you don't uh, do it by one or two among you and make sure that it's multidisciplinary. You might want it. To, in one recent FEMEA that I was invited to participate in as an external uh, member is that uh, they invited their chief financial officer. And when the, the input of the chief financial officer has blown us away uh, and that have given us an idea how much uh, cost uh, that processes have uh, been causing the organization. 
right? So, and uh, number four is a brainstorm to fill the table accordingly. So you can now see the first a few Excel sheets of the um, FEMEA. That's we have the steps and process. So what are the steps? So for example, when you, we talk, let's uh, choose one one process. Uh, let's say um, erecting a scaffold on heights, and that heights would be about more than uh, 10 meters. So what are the steps? So step one, okay, step two, step three, and step four. So you list the steps. So it's, uh, that's the reason why it says here, create a flow chart. Okay, create a flow chart, or you simply list the steps. So step one, um, well, the tubes will not go up on heights by themselves. So it might, you might, uh, how do you do that? Well, probably the workers are carrying the tubes uh, from the ground floor going to 10th floor using the stairs, or probably they tie it and they use gin and pulley, or probably they use a crane to lift all the tubes uh, on 10 meters above the ground. So uh, that's it. And step two, okay, uh, you have your barricade there, step three, so they now start the base place and everything. So that so you list all the steps. So it, to make it more fun, uh, you know, you, we use flowchart. I use flowchart. I use uh, post-it sticks and put it on the wall, and then uh, people will be. So what's your guide in the steps? So you remember you have your method statement or you have your uh, SOP, if you will. So your SOP is uh, the step-by-step -step procedure of how you do things in your company. I don't know which industry you're working at, um, but uh, I've been working with uh, pharmaceutical, I've been working with uh, construction, I've been working with oil and gas, I've been working with healthcare right now, and each organization have their step-by-step, -step how do you do this, how do you do that, you have that manual. So you put that, and then put the failure mode. So when you say failure mode, what could be, what could go wrong? So we're talking about earlier of uh, uh, erecting a scaffold in 10 meters above above uh, above the ground, above the structure. So what could go wrong? So the step one, what did what did we mention about step one? Bringing the tubes from the ground to the 10 uh, 10 meters above the above it. So how do we do that? Well, uh, they tie the tubes and then they pull it from they pull it and then the tubes go up about 10 meters above the ground. And what could go wrong? Well, the tubes could fall, the tubes could, the tubes could slip from the hands, the tube could slip from the rope, or the rope could break. So you list all those failure modes, right? So now when uh, step two, when they are erecting this uh, barricade or when they're erecting the, um, uh, the isolation area, what are the steps that could happen? Well, uh, they could fall, they could slip, trip and fall, right? So again, when uh, they are now erecting the base of the scaffold, what could happen? Well, the scaffold still could, could you know, collapse and they could also again strip, uh, strip and fall. Yeah? And then we now identify what are the causes? So we said earlier that in step one, when we are shifting those tubes from the ground. So again, this example is a hypothetical. I'm just, I'm just making it up right now, okay? So we said earlier that you are lifting the scaffolding tubes from the ground to up, but could, what would be the failure mode? The tubes could fall, right? Could slip from the rope. Okay, what could be the reason? Well, the person who tied the scaffolding tubes was not good or was not experienced or the rope was uh, uh, defective. And you now go to the effects. So if that happened, what could be the impact? Well, we have a falling object. And when we have a falling object from heights, people underneath could get hurt. Okay, a lot of people are harmed when there are a lot, uh, when there are falling objects. Although we put some barricades as a control, as a measure, we'll talk about later on. Right? So that's how we do it. From step one, identifying what could go wrong, or what are the uh, what are the risks that could happen, and how we did it happen. So you have a clear visualization of uh, how it uh, could happen, and uh, what would be the impact. So in the failure mode, you know, it's very, it's uh, very good that you invite really the front line, at least one or two members in the front line. Uh, probably the scaffolder, probably a um, uh, foreman, probably um, somebody in the in the front line who are really doing the work because they are doing the work. 
they could give you a lot of uh, feedback and their inputs so it could be a gem. Now that you have failed the failure mode, what could go wrong, you have identified how will it happen, how will this failure happen, and what could be the potential impact if this happened, you now go to uh, the next step, which is rating it by 1 to 10. All right, so the likelihood. So we now uh, go to rate with the likelihood. So let me just go back here on the failure mode. Okay, anything that could go wrong in the process, here for your uh, courses, uh, anything that, uh, uh, how would this failure, uh, failure could occur, all right, and then the impacts or uh, the effects of consequences of this failure when they occur, and now we are going now to uh, put a scoring of 1 to 10, with 10 being the most likely, and uh, we have one is the least likely. Now I'm going to go to that later on. Okay, so you score all, both of these, uh, the, the three of these, one to 10, one to 10, one to 10. And you multiply the scoring and then you now have the risk profile number. And we're going to talk about that. So I promise you, okay, the likelihood and occurrence. So here in this is a likelihood and occurrence of occurrence and like uh, severity and likelihood of detection. So here it is. So the likelihood of occurrence, so this is just an example. So this is just an example. So you might want it to uh, grade, so likelihood of occurrence, one to two is impossible to happen. So for example, if you if the team feel that it's impossible to happen, that these scaffolding tubes will fall at the height of 10 meters. Okay? And, and why did you say so? Because we never had an incident like that. Uh, we had this, uh, we had a system in place, or so da 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 da. Okay, you, it's up to the group, it's up to your team to put your scores. All right. As long as, as long as you don't just put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, no, no. You need to establish among your team or among your organization, uh, if you do be doing the FEMEA, what would be one to two look like in terms of likelihood of occurrence. So you have a basis. So in some organization, they have uh, they have created um, we we'll call it uh, a scale. Like for example, in one organization that I have been invited to uh, to is that uh, one the score of one is that one in ten thousand probability. So no known occurrence, never in history. And they say that in uh, score of two, three, four, possible but no known data. So it's a probability is one in 5,000. And uh, I remember five and six, they said that they had an incident that they have documented, but infringement. And that is one like a one into 200. And uh, when they say hi, seven or eight, they have a documented uh, event and it comes frequently. Actually it's one in a hundred. And uh, 9 and 10 is that they have documented it and they believe that it's almost certain one in, two, one, uh, in 20 incidents. So that's how they grade it. That's how they grade it. So saving severity. So 1 is likely uh, very less severe. There's no impact at all. 10 is the highest. It will create a um, very big impact to the organization. Right? So. That's uh, pretty easy, like 1 to 10. 1 is the lowest, 10 is the highest. Now, it is different when we talk about detection. So in detection, we are looking at, is it likely to uh, detect this failure mode? So when you say, uh, when we identify that the scaffold tubes will fall from height, can we detect it? Can, we, can, some, can anyone walking on the uh, site, on the construction site, can tell that, oh, that's going to fall, right? So if the, if the answer is yes, it's one to three. Now, so again, this is an example. And other organizations have established uh, metrics uh, more on probability, but you or your organization or your quality department or your risk management department might have their own scale. So I'll please take a look at that. But for the sake of uh, this exercise, like one to three, that's easily detected. 
or you might say that you can detect it, but you need to take a closer or focus. Uh, you need to look at uh, the workers lifting these scaffolding tubes and they say, oh, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. I think that scaffolding tube is going to fall, right? So that's four to five. So, but then on six to seven, well, uh, it can be detected, but difficult because it requires a specialist eye. If I'm not a scaffolder or if I'm not a scaffolding inspector or supervisor, or uh, I've been working in the construction site, but I never get involved in the, in the scaffold, but I'm looking at them lifting it and I cannot tell that it will fall. Well, that's six to seven. And eight to 10 cannot be detected. It's impossible to detect. Uh, so it's you see it's inversely proportional with the likelihood of occurrence and the severity. Uh, then you cannot detect it. You cannot detect it. And you know the, the beauty of uh, the FEMEA because it accounts now what are the mitigations that you have and what are the uh, likelihood of detection of uh, the risk. So there are some risks that are easy to detect. So anyone could say that oh it's going to happen. Or it requires, you know, how would, how did you even figure that out? I never even thought of that. Right? So that's the beauty of this. So what happens now is that when you, for example, have an example here of likelihood of seven, and then the detectability. What's the detectability of one? It says that easy to detect. So we, that's very good, right? That's very good. Um, we wanted that those uh, risks or the failure mode could be identified right away so that we could work on it. The danger is that when these risks are not identified, we don't know who, will, who we are up against to. So what happens is that if you take a look at this the scoring, it could be uh, from one, we easily detect it, and severity is eight is quite high. So our risk profile number is 56, whereas uh, we cannot detect it, it's impossible to happen, we thought that way, and it could be 560. Versus, uh, okay, so uh, someone who, have, who is a, a specialist or a supervisor would be able to detect it. So it makes the difference, it makes the difference. So the detectability uh, creates a balance on uh, the traditional risk management procedure. So again, we can now go back to the RPM. So now that you have taken your steps one, two, three, and then you have taken your multiplication, so you simply multiply it. You simply multiply. So when you multiply it, you now take the highest RPM, the highest risk profile number. So if, uh, this is 560. Now uh, the next is 280. So what do you do next? So you use the RPM to improve, uh, uh, to plan improvement efforts. The failure modes with the high uh, risk profile number are probably the most important parts of the process or the system or what do you uh, say, or the design in which to focus your improvement efforts. You know, uh, in economics, we have limited resources and time is a resource. Uh, we don't have the luxury to do everything uh, in the risk assessments. So we focus on which one is the highest risk and how do we do that? Is that when we look at the RPM, which among the which among this uh, failure mode have the highest RPM? Then that's where we use and focus our improvement efforts. So uh, failure modes with a low RPM are not likely to affect the overall process as much. Uh, so even if you eliminate them completely, they should uh, therefore be at the bottom of the list of priorities. So um, in management, uh, management speaking, um, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is it really that important? And how do you back up that uh, fact that, yes, we need to take action on this, is that you can show that RPM. So you use the FMEA to plan actions to reduce harm from failure modes. So if the failure mode is likely to occur, uh, well, you have to evaluate the costs and see if any or all of them can be eliminated. Uh, you could consider adding a forcing function or for example, probably like a physical constraint that makes committing an error impossible. Like remember the uh, microwave oven I mentioned earlier, such as the medical gas outlets that are designed to accept only those uh, gauge that match. Like for example, your screwdriver, there are screw, uh, there are uh, uh, drivers that are very specific. So even though 
Oh, let's use the socket, for example, the outlets. Uh, in here in Qatar, we have these three, uh, three pin, you know, so, right? So if you have, uh, if someone would be trying to alterate that, that's going to be impossible unless they really use four <laughs> to open the buffer. So that's dangerous. So you need to add verification steps, such as independent double checks, uh, probably barcoding or alert screen, and modify other processes that contribute to the cost. Um, if the failure is unlikely to be detected, though, um, identify other events that may occur prior to the failure mode and can serve as slugs that a failure mode might happen. And if the failure is likely to cause a severe harm, you know, have to create an uh, early warning signs that uh, will identify this failure mode. So, like for example, in, in the hospital where we are working, if the doctor is, uh, you know, prescribing medication wherein a patient is allergic to paracetamol, then the screen wherein the doctor is typing paracetamol would be giving an alert that uh, John is allergic to paracetamol. Uh, so there is this alert uh, that would uh, prompt the doctor and say, ah, okay, I did not realize that he's allergic to paracetamol. Right, so those are some of the uh, uh, examples. So, and you use the FMEA to evaluate the potential impact of changes under consideration. So, if you have like new set, new procedure, new material, what else? Um, uh, or new techniques that you wanted to incorporate in your already existing procedure or policy, then the team can use the FMEA to discuss and analyze each change you know, under consideration and uh, you calculate the RPN and if the change were implemented, uh, this will allow the team to uh, create a verbal simulation of uh, how the impact uh, could, uh, how the change could impact uh, the whole process that you're using. And you use the FMEA to monitor and track uh, improvement over time. So the team should be, should consider calculating the total RPN for the process as described above and then you set a goal for improvements. So the intent again is this one is we wanted uh, we don't want this uh, failure mode to occur, right? So we need to set a goal uh, for uh, improvement. So a team might set uh, might set a goal of decreasing the total RPN. Like what's our RPN earlier? 560 uh, into 50 percent from the baseline if we put those improvement. But above all, it's very important that. You know, you have to take a look also at your organization. When you have this high RPN, you have to take a look. Well, does our organization have already a mitigation in place on this uh, currency? So, because some organizations might have identified these uh, failure modes early on, and you might have already a mitigation in place. And probably that mitigation is uh, working or not working, and that will help you revisit. Now, you might want to say, okay, I'm on my um, ending of my slide, but uh, has it been done in construction? Yes. And, I, uh, and I, I, I'll show you a study that is done in uh, South Korea. So they are, uh, here's a study of uh, Mr. Song, Engineer Song, Engineer Yu and Engineer Kim, saying that construction safety management using familiar techniques and they were focusing on the steel frame work. So you know, this steel frame work uh, could be very dangerous. So when we talk about steel frame work, and that includes, well, um, from the fabrication, from the shifting. Well, in Korea, they have a lot of construction uh, of uh, plants. When I was uh, working with one of the projects uh, there in Ulsan, we created a prefabrication a prefab, and then they were shifting it uh, to China. They were shifting it to Australia in the ICTIS project. So um, it says here that buildings becomes larger, the possibility of accidents and recurrences. And so they, they were looking at uh, application of FEMEA. And these, they, in their study, they found out that, well, it's not much widely used. But when they used it in their study, they found out that in their 76 um, studies of steel fabrication work were uh, have improved uh, the safety uh, when they improve the safety 
and the quality will be improved, will be coming next. When quality and safety are uh, giving a very good number, what happens is that people don't need to rush, right? So they come up with a very good quality, uh, quality of output, and of course they are on time. All right. So, so this is the sample of familiar sheet that they have done. So they have, if you take a look at the leftmost C5, C5, this is just a serial number, one, two, three, four, five. And I have taken a copy of that part of uh, their familia on number five, where in transfer work of beams, so they created these beams. So now you can see here the failure. Uh, so this is the steps. This is the step of the work. So now here the uh, cost, failure cost. Okay, so it could be uh, when they have this uh, transfer of work, so they just mix it up. Uh, they just interchange it. Uh, deficiency of worker safety. So what could it what could it do? Well, it could lead to injury or death or superintendent's indifference. So what do we mean by uh, superintendent indifference? So they have different shifts. They have they have a very high turnover of manpower. Uh, accident may occur. Um, do not install fall protection safety. It could crash. There could be a, a fall from height. It could be falling objects from height. They do not uh, put safety low. They're working crash also. I said, so you take a look at number three now. They have rated it from one to 10. They have a score of four, uh, the currents of uh, frequency. How did they come up with four again? It's either you have your system of what, how, what is one, what is two, what is three, what is four. So they have that in the system. And then occurrence uh, identity. So is it, uh, is it easily identifiable? So they will put four and severity, and they chose the severity to be the fatality, right? So they put a three. So you now have the RPN, the risk profile number, and they put it into uh, highest to lowest, and 48 is the highest. So deficiency of worker safety. Actually, uh, uh, a lot of people in Korea, uh, according to the study of engineer teams, that they wanted to finish the work. They are very uh, passionate, and they're very hardworking. And uh, one of the safety issues, if someone is working from Hyundai, I was working with Hyundai last night, uh, way back in Shell Pearl, and they really are work, really working hard. Uh, and they really need to finish, they wanted to prove that they could finish it on time, on budget and on quality. And what happens is that because uh, of the time constraint, well, in any project too, you know, most there's no project that will give you enough uh, luxurious time. You need to finish it on with deadlines. And because of the deadlines, people will rush, and uh, you know the schedules uh, crumble in, and they need, need, and then uh, accidents could happen. And then because the uh, accidents happen, there's this lost time, and then they need to catch up. What happens? Quality is also going to uh, be affected. So this says is observance and education throughout the work. So uh, this is the time that they said that they had to increase more safety officers. They had to increase more training. Um, I don't, I don't, uh, uh, this is uh, their proposal. This is the uh, countermeasure that uh, the team have built. All right. So I think I mentioned earlier that they have reduced the uh, related incidents in this in the 76 workplace of uh, that they have been studying for steel framework. Uh, could it be done in um, uh, food processing or could it be done in uh, food technology? Yes. So John Spilson from Michigan Technology Food Center had conducted uh, FEMEA to recognize and eliminate uh, failures through uh, FEMEA. So uh, he said uh, uh, the team have created uh, several steps. I just took a copy of that. And like, for example, setting a cooking temperature. Well, you know, like you start with baking, and then you start with putting the ingredients. You use the, they have this big machine that is rotating some rotating equipments, mechanical equipment that uh, make sure that it's mixed thoroughly, and then it will go to the container. And then once the container is uh, filled, it will go to the mic uh, to the oven, the large oven, and they set the cooking temperature. After the setting cooking temperature, uh, they will take it out from the oven, and they'll, uh, the machine will be putting it into um, like a, a, a packaging, and then uh, it will go to the boxes uh, ready for distribution. So that's how that's how the summary. 
Yeah, I took a, a synopsis, a, a part of it, and I chose the set cooking temperature. So when they're putting those uh, mix, uh, the mix in the uh, oven, so what could happen? What could be the failure? What could go wrong? Well, maybe there's someone who is inexperienced, or maybe there's someone who is new in our team, or maybe someone who is tired and he's accidentally, you know, uh, turn on the knob and put it over a very high temperature. Or it could be the other way, other way around. Oven uh, temperature was too low. And so, what could be the impact? Okay, so what could be the impact if this happened? Well, what happens is that you know your cooks burn. <laughs> you know, it, it will burn. So you will have a uh, or you will shorten the cooking time, but uh, it's not uh, going to be edible. Uh, probably there's a problem with next step because the machine is waiting now for the cookie that they will going to put a wrap to wrap it, and oh, of course that will impact customer satisfaction. So. Uh, people will be complaining, people don't like it, people will be posting it in social media, and that will impact business, that will impact uh, loyalty, that will impact reputation, and that would mean that, you know, uh, stocks could go down, and so on and so forth. So, how would it happen? Well, um, see, there's a score that they have placed already there. Uh, they put three for short in time, cookies burn five, and then uh, the causes of this failure, well, temperature set by incorrectly by workers. See, that's what we we're talking earlier. And that could be, uh, the reason could be, you know, there's a new worker, the worker could, uh, could have been confused, right? Or the worker could have been double shift, or the thermometer is uh, inaccurate. So occurrence is one, well, it never happened, but uh, it, anyway, uh, they give a one. Three, well, very seldom because uh, we make sure that uh, our new workers will have an orientation for about two to three months before they were, are able to do, it, do the uh, machine machinery by themselves. Well, do we have a mitigation in place already? None. All right, so are we able to detect? Well, you could detect it when you had a good sense of smell. So that's fine. But if you don't have a good sense of smell, and suddenly, uh, because we're all wearing masks, and suddenly uh, we have colds, it's cold season, we might not be able to detect it. So multiply it, you'll get the risk profile number. And then, so what's now the recommended action? So what are we going to do? So uh, the action on the right side, and they need to train and have temperature set, uh, settings available, uh, calibrate gauge regularly, and uh, add alarm that alerts operator when the temperature is out of spec or I would add like, uh, quality control uh, inspections um, uh, often, um, right? Or it could be, uh, so same, same thing with the uh, setting the oven too, uh, too low. That also would um, uh, create an uh, impact. I'm not going to go too much of that. I'm running out of time. Also in healthcare, so I, mean, I think I mentioned earlier, before I go to this example, I mentioned earlier about medication administration and we're doing that. In healthcare, um, we love to do FEMEA because we love to see if these processes are uh, impacting. So more so, I hope that you appreciate it because we're dealing with lives. So if these, uh, there are failure modes that impacts, uh, impacts the patient safety, then that's really something that we need to look at. So um, uh, here's an excerpt from the radiographics and uh, Dr. Thornton as a radiologist uh, with his colleagues, uh, and they had the title of the study application of failure mode and effect analysis in the radiology department. So this is how they did the study. They have the step one, so just like what we said earlier. So, uh, and then they have assembled a team. So if you take a look at the team, they have recorder, they have technologists, they have nurse. They even invited a patient because of a uh, patient representative, of course, who knows your service? Who, uh, who is your end user of your service? So it's the patients. They are the customers. They also invite a risk manager. I would like to invite quality as well here. Uh, all right, applying all processes. So they did all the steps and they identified the failure mode, just like we said. And then once they have uh, seen the RPN, they now assign actions and they have uh, given risk owners and repeats. So 
Let, I will give you a taste of uh, what are the pro processes that they have. Like for example, order. All right, so who gives order? Right, uh, probably the GP, the general practitioner, the doctor that you have visited. Okay, he will be ordering an X-ray. So what are the sub processes? Well, the order is uh, fax. You know, this is old. This is an old version. Uh, we don't do the fax anymore. But in case it's fax, you know, they fax it uh, from the from the doctor's office to the radiology department. They fax it. What could be? What could happen? Well, the request is lost. Okay, so it's you see, this is a great thing. You know, when you do it multidisciplinary, a lot of ideas will come in. So the machine, uh, my fax machine is broken. So what will happen? You will not be able to receive the the request the rec uh, the request is lost why somebody took it and uh, he thought that that's fast is for, uh, for him for himself or for herself request fax to the wrong number okay probably the doctor dialed the wrong number and it went somewhere else so here if you take a look at the potential risks they have identified as many as they can so these are the they fax it screening form completed a the MR imaging protocol, all right, and so on and so forth. All right, so here's another one: transport some processes. So uh, the patient is transported from the ward, maybe, and going to the clinical imaging. So here are now the different uh, potential risks, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. So, so you see now here process number one: the doctor made a request, so he ordered it in the system. He write it in a piece of paper and. Uh, he fax it. Now the patient is now going to the clinical imaging to do the MRI or X-ray, and these are the failure modes that uh, happen that could happen. And now the technologists or the X-ray, uh, sorry, the clinical radiologist will be doing the process. So what will happen? Well, he will acquire the images from the computer, probably the computer will show uh, will show a different image so that's maybe it's not going to work or it's not going to uh, uh, it is unstable so here in here in, uh, in this when the technologist is now performing is uh, imaging there are different different sub uh, processes same was true as you so potential risks are uh, here as well so uh, they have identified a total RPN of 72 for request loss so, and you see here, detection score is eight. Why? Detection eight means that it's difficult to detect that the document is missing uh, because uh, probably they don't have uh, probably they don't have a, a mechanism in place. The fax machine broken. The likelihood of occurrence is two. Why? Because it rarely broke in their in their experience. Severity is three. Again, detection score is eight. Again, when we say uh, detection is eight, it's high, it's difficult to detect. Insufficient clinical data on request, so on and so forth. All right, and then we have here patient vomits contrast after oral material is administered. All right. So here now, uh, request lost. So they have the RPN of 72, action generate electronic requests instead of hard copy, provider order uh, entry oversight and committee, so this is the, the action, and it's always good, even when you're doing um, risk assessments, it's uh, very important that you have a, a risk owner so that uh, someone would uh, be accountable in making sure that the action plans are uh, taken care of. All right, with that, I say thank you, and I hope that uh, uh, you enjoyed the presentation. Actually, I made an Excel sheet uh, ready for us today tonight, and I would like to invite somebody to and, uh, share a process, and then we'll do an FMEA together. But I think um, we are not uh, having a good, we're, not, we're running out of time. But in most workshops that I join, and uh, uh, we normally have uh, this uh, exercise so that you could really feel. So what's in for now is that when you go back to your organization, when you go back to your own company, number one is that you look at new processes or you, want, you might want to look at uh, what is one thing that you wanted to, uh, to do a FEMEA with and what would, what would uh, trigger you to do a FEMEA? Well, probably there's a lot of incidences that are occurring or probably there's a new change. Uh, sorry, sorry, it's a new change. There's a change in your organization. There's a new product. There's a new service. 
before you introduce them, you might want to evaluate it, right? So you might want to evaluate it before you're going to uh, have it live, right? So, or the process or SOP could be already existing, right? So if you're already existing, so um, you might want to take a look at that. So before it occurs. So in contrast now to in contrast now to the traditional risk assessment that we are doing, in traditional risk assessment, we call we have this calculation of uh, risk and uh, sorry the severity and the occurrence. We don't uh, take into consideration the uh, detectability. So we should also are going to uh, make it uh, uh, an integral part of the risk assessment. All right. So thank you very much. Uh, in the common context, uh, I got uh, in the common context, uh, someone was asking me if this is the same with the TSTI or the Total Safety Task Instructions. I think it's uh, somewhat similar. Uh, it's a kind of uh, proactive risk assessment, but it's uh, different from the Total Safety Task Instruction or the TSTI. It's not also the same with the toolbox. It's actually you need to uh, have it, uh, you, sit, you need to uh, sit down and review the process really from the uh, standpoint. All right, thank you very much. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you for a really interesting um, presentation, um, Jonovic. Um, there aren't any questions. There are a couple of comments to say thank you. Really interesting webinar. Um, so I'd like to thank you for speak, spending your time speaking with us today. And I'd like to thank everybody for attending and also apologize for those of you who may have had sound issues at the beginning of the presentation. Oh, I've just had a question come in. Have you any experience of firefighters using this assessment tool? The for firefighters. Yes. Have any have you any experience of firefighters using this assessment tool? Um I'll be honest that I have not uh, experienced uh, any firefighter, but I could look it up and I'll get back to you. I'll take a look at the literature. But so far in my experience um I have not been involved or invited or have uh, taken a look at uh, firefighting uh, procedure or principles. And that. But that's uh, something that we need, really need to look at. So why did I say it's not interesting and something that's very good to look at? It's because, well, you see, there are, we have incidences of firefighters who get themselves harmed. Or, and I don't, uh, we need to take a look at how the procedure for firefighting look like. So, for example, when there's a fire, the firefighters get in or uh, the training as well. So that will give us an insight, an insight. And, then, you know, we um, might be surprised if we'll be able to see some failure modes. And that failure modes I'm now thinking is that when our firefighters hurt, when firefighters are not contained, when our firefighters have uh, been uh isolated in one area and are not able to reach out for the target area so this is good to, good, that's good to look at thank you and there's one more question how much do management of change and for me vary yes you know when you when your organization do not have this yet in place and you wanted to introduce for me that's not, that's not really going to be a, a very good conversation with you with your safety manager or safety quality manager in place because you need to you need to uh, put forward a reason why uh, you need to have this in place so you might want it to have a literature you uh, you might want it to uh, explore pieces of incidents in your area and the bottom line is that you need to, to let management see it from the perspective of business that if we keep on losing this or if we if this uh, failure mode occur this will cost us so mostly in the leader and in the management uh, they would like to see well if you're going to do something is going is it going to worth the time worth the resources that we are investing it so uh, there's uh, if you don't have it yet if you don't have it yet that's uh, that's how you're going to need a lot of uh, work on that. But if you already have it and you're not using it, well, I think uh, you have to look at in your within your own management as well as your stakeholder stakeholders who are who, who have experience uh, understanding quality in the perspective of uh, performance improvements. 
Excellent, thank you. We've had a couple more questions in, if you're okay answering these. How often do we review the FEMIA? Right, very good. So I just mentioned earlier. So when there, whenever uh, there's a new, ch uh, there's a change uh, in your process, you have to do a FEMIA. Whenever uh, you need to uh, annual, when you wanted to see, well, uh, it seems that our strategy in, in minimizing this failure is not working. You need to review your FEMIA. You need to be updated. You need to take a look. There are new changes. That, uh, sorry, I keep on using the new changes. There are changes that are happening constantly around. Like, for example, when you are in a manufacturing industry, there might be a construction beside you that's, going, that's happening. Uh, right now, you see a crane on the other side. Tomorrow, no, there's this excavation. <laughs> right? So whenever there are changes that occur, you might want to look at your familiar. Um, whenever there are, uh, when you see that your improvement or performance improvement uh, strategies are uh, taking it too slow to take, uh, to take these changes that you wanted to see, the milestones wanted to see, you might, you might want as well to review your family as well. Because maybe those actions are not uh, valid anymore. You might want it to look at, uh, you might want it to do differently. Fantastic. I'm just going to ask one more question because we're we're kind of over time now. Is there any formal training and certification for FEMIA in Qatar that you know of? The, yes. Yeah. I think there are a lot of uh, trainings, a uh, lot of training organizations offering uh, FEMIA, not just FEMIA itself. Uh, FEMIA is one of the tools earlier that I mentioned earlier, and um, there are other two. There are other tools that are uh, in bundle with the FEMI. I think it's a quality, it's a quality management. Uh, when you have your risk management, uh, these are uh, some of the tools that are in place. Um, let me speak on uh, for on behalf of the Ministry of Public Health in Hamad Medical Corporation. Uh, FEMI is a regular uh, training offered to healthcare staff, and uh, especially in the quality perspective. In uh, other industries, I am not that sure. I'm not sure. And is there a certification for FEMIA? No, there's no certification. I have looked at it, and there's no certification for FEMIA. So if you wanted to, to uh, reach out to your quality manager or your safety manager or your risk manager, if you have in your organization, they are the right person to reach out uh, to, uh, to have it. Thank you for that. So it just leaves me to thank you for a really interesting webinar. The presentation will be uploaded in the next couple of days to the IRSM YouTube channel. And I wish everybody a good evening or good afternoon, whereabouts you are in the world. And thank you once again. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everybody. Good night.